Doesn't look like we all got the tan blazer memo today. Looking nice over there. All right. Um, lesson two of the songs of Jesus, seeing Jesus in the Psalms. I'm going to start out with a little bit of a review from last week. Last week we learned that the Psalms were used in what in both Old and New Testament? Anybody remember? Public worship. That is correct. Quoted and sung by who and who? Jesus. Yes, that's always a good, a good answer. Who else? What's that? Mm, that's technically correct, yeah? The apostles. Apostles and Jesus. Uh, most familiar part of the Bible for most Christians in what times? All times? Mm, I don't think so. The Dark Ages? I have medieval. I don't know. Well, that's Steve. Is that close enough? <laughs> Professor Steve. Um, equal footing with what and what? Jesus talked about the Psalms in the same breath with what two authorities? The law of, well, that's close. That's like a merging of the two answers. The law of Moses and the prophets. Credit. <laughs> you get half credit. Half credit. Trains you for every what, what, and what condition. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and click on this one. Spiritual, social, and emotional condition. Put your life in the context of what is blank about God. Did I hear true? Yeah, true. What's true about God? And we're written to be what? Done. Written to be done. That was the main point of lesson number one. That the Psalms were written to be done. And when you do them, which means reading them, reciting them, praying them, singing them, it will transform your life. Now, we're still not going to get, actually at the end of this class, hopefully we'll have time, we'll read Psalm 1. So we'll actually read a psalm. Uh, we'll, we'll begin in earnest next week on actually studying uh, the specific psalms. But today what I wanted to do is talk about structure. Uh, when I started th to sit down and prepare for this class, I learned a lot that I did not know. Um, or as is often the case as I get older, I learn things that I might have known, but I forgot. Um, and that is the structure of the book of Psalms. And so today we're going to go over that structure so that when we do read the Psalms uh, as a class throughout the rest of this quarter, we'll kind of have an understanding of where it fits in the grand scheme of things. Okay, before we get started, what is the message of Psalms? Anybody know what the message of Psalms is? Or have any idea? Want to hazard a guess? Praise God? Okay. That's a good one. Any, anyone else? It's a little bit of a, a trick question in that um, we don't often talk about this. We don't often think about this. What is the message of Psalms? It's a whole bunch of individual psalms, songs that um, unless you kind of read it all the way through and take a step back and, and look at it, you might not realize what the overarching message is. It can get lost in the vastness of the book, in other words. Um, so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to take a step back and we're going to look at the individual pieces uh, of the psalms. Now, first, I'm going to start with authors. There's 150 Hebrew poems, songs and prayers in this book. Um, and, and it breaks down like this. David wrote 75. If you Google how many Psalms did David write, it'll say 73. Um, but Psalm 2 and Psalm 95 are attributed to David by the New Testament writers um, in Acts and Hebrews. So um, I figured that's good enough for me. So I raised the number to 75. Um, Asaph wrote 12. He is a, um, a worship leader. Um, and a priest, which makes him a Levite. The sons of Korah are a guild of singers and compo composers. They wrote 10. Um, Solomon and Moses wrote three. Moses wrote one and Solomon wrote two. Um, Heman and Ethan uh, each wrote one. They are both considered wise. They're, they're musicians and singers, and they're called Ezraites. And um, 
I am not prepared to get into a conversation on what that means. Um, just know that they were called that. Um, and then the rest of the Psalms, about a third of them were anonymous. Now, the Psalms were written for the choir, and you'll see that a lot in the headers of these Psalms, written for the choir master. They were written as songs. They are songs. But I would contend that they were not, this was not written as a hymn book. And what I mean is, the authors who wrote these songs did not sit down and go, oh, I'm going to write a song book. This is going to be the, you know, this is hymns for worship or sacred selections or whatever. We're going to call this the Psalter or the Psalms and we're going to compile that. We talked about that last time. They were compiled at different times in history into the structure that we're going to talk about today. Um, any comments or thoughts on that before I move on to the next? It's not, that's not the same Cora, no, no. Good point. <clears throat> um, okay, so to start, we're going to look at the conclusion. It's the easiest place, I think, to start when you're trying to figure out what the message of the Psalms is, what the structure of the Psalms is or are. I don't know. Uh, not good in English. So there are five uh, Psalms at the end of the books of, book of Psalms, 146 through 150, and they all start with hallelujah. So Grant, that was an excellent, um, excellent response to what is the message of, of Psalms. Praise God. These five Psalms that conclude the entire book, they have that message of hallelujah or praise Yahweh, which means to praise God. Um, it, it, is, it is actually a command, a Hebrew command to praise God, and it is the conclusion of the book. So when you read through the book of Psalms, the conclusion, the obvious conclusion, and they, you know, the writers hit you over the head with it at the beginning and end of each one of these, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. That is the message of this book. Um, now, we've covered the conclusion. Let's start back at the beginning. Let's look at the introduction. Now, we talked last time that book one was, was written by David. Most people, most scholars will tell you that Psalms 1 and 2 were anonymous, and that's why they're kind of separated out from book one to be the introduction. But, but Psalm 2, we already said, has been attributed to David later. Uh, however, they do the theme of these two Psalms do fit in nicely as an introduction for the entire collection. Um, so... Psalm 1 starts with, blessed is the one who meditates on the Torah. Does anybody know what the Torah is? Bless you. The books of the law, okay? So the first five books of the Bible is the Torah, or the, in English we call it the Pentateuch, right? Um, and what does Torah mean? It's a trick question. It means teaching. I have it up on the screen. Torah means teaching. So in one sense, what the Psalm 1 is saying is, blessed is the one who meditates on the literal Torah, the book, uh, five books of Moses. But it also has another meaning, which is that blessed is the one who meditates on the teaching or the word of God. And remember, we talked about the Psalm itself is divided into five books. And each of those five books kind of in theme and in, in, in message mirror the, the five books of Moses. So it's blessed is the one who meditates on the word of God, the first five books. Blessed is the one who meditates on the Psalms that mirrors the first five books. Blessed is the one who meditates on the teaching of God. So this has a message that's relevant to all of us still today, as relevant as it was to the Jews of that time. Um, so that means uh, meditating. What, is, what does that mean? How, how do we meditate on the Torah or on the teaching. Okay, different than study. Yes. Yeah, so like a cow, choose its cut over and over. <clears throat> Gross analogy, but yes. Um, we need to, we need to read it, think on it, 
uh, sleep on it, read it again, think on it some more. It's this idea of daily, daily reading it, obeying it to the best of your ability, thinking on it. Wait a minute. How does this apply to my life? Oh, I'm in a new situation, a uh, new scenario here, or I've grown and have a new understanding of certain things about life whatever it might be. And now I go back to the word and it has even more meaning for me, right? John, were you going to say something else? Yeah, right. That's right. Um, so that's what the psalmist is telling us here in Psalm 1, that we need to meditate or read daily, contemplate, apply to our lives, obey, etc., um, the Torah or the teaching, and then it ends with this idea that the Psalms is a new Torah, and it is a new Torah about prayer. Uh, so the message here for us is we need to think about the Psalms the same way the Jews thought about the Torah, um, and we need to meditate on them daily if we want the blessings of God. Now, Psalm number two it reflects on the promises of King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Um, the promise of a messianic king would come through the line of David, would establish an, a kingdom and defeat evil and rebellion among the nations. And then it goes on to say that blessed are those who take refuge in the king. But this is interesting. As an introduction, the pair of Psalms, Psalms 1 and 2, starts and ends with blessings. You'll see that kind of thing a lot in the Bible. The, the re repetition is, is usually pretty meaningful, right? They repeat things that we really need uh, to get an understanding of. And this repeats this idea of blessing and blessing. It starts and ends with blessing. Um, and together, what these two psalms tell us is that the psalms is a prayer book of God's people who are faithful to the Torah or to the teaching while they hope and wait for the Messiah. Blessed are those who meditate on the teaching of God while waiting for the Messiah. And who is the Messiah? Jesus. Uh, so again, seeing Jesus in the Psalms right in the very introduction, it points to the fact that Jesus is coming. Any thoughts on this? Comments? All right. There are two main categories of poems in the Psalms. Poems of lament were meant to be prayers of pain, confusion, and anger. They were meant to draw attention to what's wrong in the world, and they were meant to ask God to do something about it. You, you'll see David literally tell God to wake up and do something about what's going on. It's uncomfortable sometimes the way he, he speaks to God, but he literally, he says, God, wake up and do something about this. And so what this teaches us, I think, is that it's okay to have prayers that are focused on lament. It's okay to go to God. It's not only okay, it's, it's, it's actually, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it, it's something you should be doing, right? You should be going to God and talking to him about your pain and your confusion and your anger. I think a lot of times we shy away from that. Um, and, and I'll just tell you, be a little bit vulnerable here and tell you a little bit about <clears throat> my life. I've had a lot of struggles to the point where at, at one point I really kind of stopped praying. I sort of did the, the basics, but my prayer life had really drastically dropped off because I was angry about all of the struggles that I was dealing with and how long I had been dealing with so many of these struggles, um, particularly related to Janie and her mental health. And I started seeing a therapist, and he told me that my biggest problem was that I re repressed my emotions. Um, I'd gotten to the point where I was suffering from panic attacks, and it got so bad to the point where if I thought about having a panic attack, I would panic about having a panic attack. And the therapist told me that was called fear of fear. So I had fear of fear, and one of the reasons was because I had suppressed my emotions all my life from my childhood um, struggles. And so I started making a conscious effort of thinking about what my emotions were and voicing my emotions. There's this thing called a feelings wheel that you can go, and if you're feeling sad, it like splits it out into all these other very more specific emotions or angry or whatever it is. And I started trying to refer to that and thinking through what I was feeling. And then it hit me. I need to tell God. I need to tell God what I'm feeling. And, and even to the point, I remember it very clearly driving through downtown Crestwood, 
and just deciding that I was going to tell God that I was angry about my situation. And it turned everything around. Just turned everything around talking to him about my emotions. I felt a closeness to him that I hadn't in a very long time. And so now I pray all the time. Um, well, you know, I pray a lot, let's just say. Uh, and so I highly recommend this. I personally know the, the kind of power that praying laments could have in your life. So if you haven't tried that, you should definitely give that a try. Now, what we're going to see is that Psalms of Lament dominate books one through three. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at here next. Um, books one through three. All right, book one of the Psalms, and that's going to be a little hard to see. It was easier to see in the back classroom. Um, but book uh, one, which is made up of Psalms 3 through 41. In the center, there is a collection of Psalms, Psalms 15 through 24, that open and close with a call to covenant faithfulness. Um, and, and what it says at the top there, um, oh, sorry, it's a call to covenant faith, faithfulness. Now, following verse or Psalms 15, in Psalms 16 through 18, there is a depiction of David as the model of this kind of covenant faithfulness. And he asks for deliverance, and God makes him king. So it says up there, David's past deliverance and elevation as king. Now, in, in Psalms 20 through 23, which are the Psalms uh, immediately preceding 24, it shows David of the past as an image of the messianic king of the future who will also call out to God and will be delivered and will be given a kingdom over all the nations. And right in the middle of all of this is Psalm 19, which praises God for the Torah, praises God for his teaching. So right here, just in book one, which is Psalms 3 through 41, we see that, se that theme that we saw in the introduction, which makes perfect sense, right? Blessed are those who meditate on the teaching um, while they're waiting for the Messiah. This is a lot, and I'm, the whole class this time is going to be a lot. So stop me at any point if you have any questions or comments. Anything on book one? Okay, <clears throat> book two, and that is Psalm 42 through 72. It opens with two specific poems. Psalms 42 and 43, and they unite in hope for a future return to the temple in Zion. Now, this is closely associated with the hope of the Messianic kingdom. And the book also closes with a psalm that depicts the future reign of the Messianic king over all the nations. It echoes the prophets. We see there, I, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, it references Isaiah and Zechariah. It, it echoes their prophecies about the Messiah, and his reign is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, where God promised Abraham that the Messianic king will be a blessing to all nations. Any thoughts here? All right, book three. Um, Psalms 73 through 89, it concludes with a poem that ref, uh, reflecting on the promise to David, but this time it is in the light of the exile. Um, the poet remembers God's promise not to abandon the line of David. He's looking at their rebellion, downfall, and destruction of the kingdom and slash the line of, of David and ends by asking God not to forget his promise. And again, this is another example, at least for me, where it's a little bit uncomfortable uh, to, to, to say, God, don't forget your promise. I mean, we know God uh, is faithful and true, and he always delivers. He's faithful to uh, deliver what he has promised us. And yet here we see the psalmist saying, don't forget your promise. Because he's looking at a situation where it feels like the promise is not going to happen. It feels like the line of David won't be held up because of of the exile. Um, and he's almost as a way of assuring himself, he's asking God not to forget. Well, a couple of things there to, to, to kind of draw out of this is that um, God is in charge and he is in control no matter what it looks like, right? He has a plan and he will deliver on his plan no matter what happens. 
Uh, the story of Joseph comes to mind where he says, you meant it for evil and God used it for good. God can take whatever circumstance we're in and, and fulfill his will for us in that circumstance. The other thing that, that pops out is me is it's okay to talk to God about what you're feeling. And this author is saying, God, don't forget. Please don't forget. It doesn't feel like from my perspective that things are going to go the way I thought they were going to go. Please don't forget. And of course, we know God did not forget because he raised up Jesus, who was of the lineage of David. So that, in a very quick um, kind of summary, is books one through three. And again, in these books, we're going to see poems of lament far more than we're going to see poems of praise. Any thoughts, Matt? Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, for those who are watching online, Matt said that um, asking God to remember his promise is not anything different than what he does for himself. Uh, the rainbow or the war bow in the sky pointing away from the earth was his memorial reminder to himself to keep his promise not to destroy the earth again, right? And I like how you said that because the, the word there is bow, which represents a weapon, and turning it away from the earth means that he's not going to use it against the earth again. Uh, excellent point. John? Okay, so yeah, an example from Nehemiah where he's doing the same thing. I'm sure there are multiple places in the Bible where we can find this kind of example. Um, any other thoughts? Okay. Poems of praise were meant to be prayers of joy and celebration, draw attention to what's good in the world, and retell the story and thank God for the things that are good. And this is the prominent type of poem that we find in books four through five. There are still uh, psalms of lament in books four and five, but the primary psalm here is one of praise. And it makes sense because as you progress through uh, the new Torah or the teaching that is in the psalms, it's bringing you it more and more towards Christ. It's all forward thinking towards the Messiah coming and, and, and having reign over all nations. So you would expect as you get closer to that, that there would be more praise there. Um, okay, let's see here. Books. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about um, poems of praise is uh, another obvious inclination there is uh, the, the last five books being all about praise God, praise God, praise God, over and over. The whole structure of the way these psalms have been compiled points to that idea of praising God. And so it makes sense in books four and five that praise is the primary a way of, of expressing that. <clears throat> okay, book four. Book four is Psalms 90 through 106, and it responds to the crisis of exile. Psalm 90 takes us back to Israel's roots with the prayer of Moses, and it does what he did on Mount Sinai after the golden calf, which is to ask for mercy. We have the Psalm of Moses beginning book four, asking for mercy. And then the center group of poems, it announces that the Lord God of Israel reigns as the true king. All nature are summoned to celebrate the fact that the future day, uh, the fu in the future, God will bring justice and over, the, over the nations of the earth and his, he will give um, kingdom to his son, the messianic king. And all the world will bow down to him. I think this is another important thing, too, that, that I've learned in, in studying the Psalms is to incorporate this kind of thing in, uh, in my prayers as much as I can, um, to, to actually give praise to God and to, to praise him for the things that he's done in your life um, specifically, because it, it really helps um, draw you closer to him. And it's the same, same way with your spouse if they do something for you, to thank them very specifically about that. Um, the same is true with talking to God. And we know all praise and glory and honor it belongs to him. We can't even really fully fathom all of the things that he's done. 
book five. This class is going faster than it did last quarter, so <clears throat> if, if you're holding on to any comments, feel free. Uh, book five opens with a poem that affirms God hears the cries of his people, and it will bring the future, he will bring the future king uh, to defeat evil, and uh, he will establish his kingdom. It also contains two very large sections. We talked about one of these last class the Hallel, and the Songs of Ascent. Um, and then each concludes with a poem about the, the Messianic King, uh, Messianic Kingdom. What did we say about the Hallel? Anybody remember? It was praising God for, for deliverance from Egypt. So they sang it at Passover, Psalms 113 through 118. And the songs of the ascent are also praises to God, and they are the psalms that would be sung as they went up to Jerusalem uh, or went up to the, to the temple. Um, and it was just something that they did as a reminder of God and his promises. Um, uh, I have to turn around and read this. Together, the, the Hallel and the Songs of Ascent sustain hope in a future exodus when God redeems his people. So, in the Hallel, um, we see about their exodus from Egypt. Uh, in the Songs of Ascent, uh, it points to the Messianic Kingdom. So there is, if you think about it, there is going to be another exodus. There's going to be God saving us um, from, from the tyranny of sin and death. And he is going to deliver us to his eternal kingdom. All of this points to that. Um, in between these two, the Hallel and the Songs of the Ascent, is Psalm 119, which is the longest psalm uh, in the book. Anybody know why it's so long? It's alphabetical. It's an acrostic uh, poem. Each line of the poem starts with a, a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it explores, explores the wonder and gift of the Torah as God's word to his people. And again, it has the themes of, of Psalm 1 and 2 combined in its message, the introduction to the book. The idea of blessed are those who meditate on the teaching while they're waiting for the Messiah. Any, I'm going through this probably a little too fast. Any thoughts? All right. Yeah, I, I didn't either. I, I, and I, it was, it was eye-opening to the point where I was like, okay, we at least have to cover this in one class. Um, the, the, the individual psalms is where all the fun is, but I think having this is a good, a good foundation for understanding of, of the psalms. Okay, so this brings us back to the conclusion. The, the five psalms that say over and over again, hallelujah. Now, in the center... Psalm 148, um, and specifically in verse 14, it says, God has raised up a horn for his people. What does that mean? God has raised up a horn to his people. I'm sorry? What's that? Yeah. Oh, like he's blowing the horn for us? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't see anything wrong with that, with that view of it. Um, certainly God is calling his, his children to him. But I think this is more like, um, it is a imagery of like a holding a horn up in victory in battle, which was a common practice back then. Hold on to the horns of the altar for mercy. Yeah, that's another good uh, horn imagery. The other thing that we see here um, is that the same kind of language is used in Hannah's song um, in, in 1 Samuel, and it's also used in Psalm 132. Um, and so it's meant to, it's meant to uh, 
invoke images, images of victory, and the horn itself actually stands for the future king. It, it represents the Messiah. Messiah. So God is going to raise up the Messiah for his people, and the Messiah himself is going to bring victory for his people. So in the midst of all this praising of God, and, and that's another thing that you'll see, particularly in the Old Testament, uh, this, the, the idea that the, the real message is in the middle, and the beginning and the end kind of mirror each other, but they all point to that middle message, which in this case is that God is going to raise up Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior, and, and have victory over sin and death and evil. And he's going to reign over all the nations. Um, and I have a note here to read for Samuel. Sorry, I'm sitting here squinting and I got glasses. 110, can you read just verse 10? He will exalt the horn of his anointed. Yeah, that's great imagery there. And we know that Christ is also referred to as the anointed, the Messiah, the anointed, uh, the horn of victory. Any thoughts? First, First Samuel 2.10 and Psalm 132.17. Um, Psalm 148, 14. Sorry. Okay, so let's, let's put it all together. Let's figure out what the, what the message is all together. This is what, what we just discussed looks like. There are five books. There's, there's two psalms that serve as an introduction. There are five psalms that serve as a conclusion. The introduction, again, says... Blessed are those who are faithful to the Torah, which we now know means, uh, in one sense, the Psalms, which is the new Torah, and it also can represent largely the teachings of God. Blessed are those who are faithful to the Torah while they hope and wait for the Messiah. Now, one thing we did not talk about yet is the fact that books 1 through 4 all end with the same message, the very last verse of each one of the books. And remember, these books, these psalms were written at all different times, and they were kind of compiled after the fact. Um, but the last verse in each psalm, each book, one through four, tells us this. May the Lord God of Israel be blessed forever. Amen and amen. So blessed are those who are faithful to God while they wait for God's teaching, while they wait for the Messiah. And may the Lord God of Israel be blessed forever. And then the conclusion, as we know, it's praise Yahweh, praise God. And so when you look at this in total, the, the messages are uh, Torah and Messiah, teaching and Messiah, lament and praise, faith and hope. This is all meant to bring us closer to God. Any thoughts on this? Any surprises? Any additional comments? Questions? Yeah. I So, so I guess, briefly, how I would describe the Psalms is that it is a collection of songs or poems that were meant to be read and sung that mirror the message of the first five books of the Bible that bring us to Jesus as the Messiah, as the King. So these are songs, these are prayers that when we read them, they teach us how to talk to God teach us how to deal with issues in our life, and they teach us about the fact that God is, has delivered his son, Jesus, for, 
for victory over all of the nations over sin and death. That was probably not as brief as I had in my brain when I started to say it. Mm -hmm. But it'll become more evident as we get into the class and we start reading some of these individual songs. Because we're, gonna, we're not only just going to read the psalm and talk about the psalm itself, but where possible we're going to point to the New Testament and show how they connect. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, let's read Psalm 1. I'm going to go ahead and read this. I still haven't figured out how we'll do individual reading in the class. Um, I guess we'll just give it a shot and go from there. Um, but let's, let's look at Psalm 1 together. I have the entire Psalm on here. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So, a couple of things that I wanted to point out here in Psalm 1. First of all, it talks about the law of the Lord. It says that God, um, blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. We've been talking about this today, right? What does the law mean? What does the law refer to? The law of the Lord. The Torah. Yes, um, it refers to the Torah. It refers to the Psalms. It refers to all of Scripture. Blessed are those who delight in the teaching of God. Blessed are those who meditate on the law. And again, that was contemplate, think out, uh, figure out the implications for you, for everyone, especially, but especially applying it to your life in whatever situation that you're in. And it's not a one and done. You don't sit down and read the Psalms and go, okay, this is what it's telling me to do. And then 10 years go by. You're not the same person that you were when you first read it. So you're going to continually read it. It's a daily thing um, that you're going to do because as you change, as your perspective changes, you get more and more out of the Word of God. The other, the other idea that I wanted to pull out is this idea of delight. What does delight mean when it says blessed is the one whose delight is in the law? What does that mean? What's that? Joyful? That's a part of it. Yes. Any other thoughts? I'm sorry? Take pleasure in? Is that what I heard over here? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's not just, okay, this is God's word. This is what he wants me to do. This is what he doesn't want me to do. So I'll do this and I won't do that. I followed it. I followed it. But he did, I did what he wanted me to do and I didn't do what he didn't want me to do. Is that delighting in the law? I think, I think not. I think it's when you love obeying God. You absolutely love obeying God. It's a weird thing to think about. You know, we talk a lot about our struggles and our, our temptations, and, and we, know, we know that the formula for sin is when your desire meets an opportunity, and then you act on that opportunity. So desire plus opportunity plus action equals sin. And we talk a lot about cutting out that action part. Don't do these things. Stay away from it. Run away from it. Cut that action part out of the equation. And it nullifies the whole equation, and therefore there's no sin. Uh, we, we talk a lot about opportunity. Don't go places where you're going to potentially run into the thing that, that you desire. Cut that out, and you'll, you'll eliminate sin. But we stop there a lot of times. We don't talk about the desire part. If you, if you didn't desire the thing in the first place, the opportunity and the action wouldn't even come into play. That's the furthest upstream that you could solve that sin problem, right? Desire. 
And so I think in a subtle way, what the, what the author here is telling us is that our desire ought to be, actually, it's not so subtle. Our desire ought to be the law of the Lord. That's what our desire ought to be. And so when we have the opportunity to fulfill the law of the Lord, we're going to take it. And that's obedience. If your desire is for the law and you have the opportunity to serve and you take action, that's obedience. That's the other equation. And so we need to think about that. Do we begrudgingly follow his law or do we delight in it? Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for those online, uh, meditation also has this idea of uh, muttering or uttering or saying out loud the, the law as another way of ingraining it in your life. And that actually reminded me uh, years ago, a uh, long time ago, I had this job and uh, it was my first VP job. And, and I had a guy reporting to me that would talk about his love for God all the time. And you never hear that in the workplace. And it just really struck me. And it wasn't like he was showing off or he was trying to make a point. He just talked that way. He would just talk about it. And I thought, wow, that's, I want that. Like, I, I didn't have that in my life because when I was at work, I didn't, I talked about work things and I didn't talk about God, but you should be talking about it all the time. So I 100% agree, that is a form of meditation. Portions of the Psalms read every three days? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Did somebody? Yeah. Enthusiastic, yeah. That's right. That's the way we ought to look at it. Um, every opportunity to serve, every opportunity to worship, we ought to be excited to open up the Word every day and read it? Absolutely. All right, so just to, to show the outline again, we're going to get into the good stuff next class. And how many we get through in a class depends on, you know, the, the conversation uh, a lot of times. I am not going to stop a good conversation and just for the sake of getting through all of these. Again, the first group is non-Messianic Psalms that were quote, quoted by Jesus, and the second group is... Messianic Psalms, some of which were quoted by Jesus. And we're going to go through them one at a time and get through as many as we can. So that's kind of why I have lessons 3 through 5, then lessons 6 through 11. I will tell you that we, we only got through Psalm 69 in the last class and we had 13 lessons. So um, I doubt we'll get through them all, but we'll see what happens. Any other last minute comments? The rest of this will not be lecture style. It'll be conversational. Oh, absolutely. I do know what you mean. That is an excellent point. So quickly, um, Lisa is saying that, uh, let's see, the, what part of it was it? The wicked will not stand in, in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. And she, you know, like we're all sinners. So how can we be in the assembly of righteous if we're all sinners? We're actually going to hit on that several times in the Psalms. One of the, the most profound messages I've learned from David in his Psalms is that God, can, God, when he says that he's forgiven you, he forgives you. It's done. It's over. It's erased. It's gone. You, he makes you righteous. And we have a hard time dealing with that. We have a hard time dealing with that. 
But I think reading these songs is going to help. All right, thank you for your participation.